Let us pray. O gracious God and most merciful Father, who has vouchsafed us the rich and precious jewel of thy holy word, assist us with thy spirit that it may be written in our hearts to our everlasting comfort, to reform us, to renew us according to thine own image, to build us up into the perfect building of thy Christ, and to increase us in all heavenly virtues. Grant this, O heavenly Father, for the same Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Well, we are finally, it's been a long slog, a difficult climb, but we have finally reached the summit as we begin today our study of the eighth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. It has been described invariably by scholars as the high point, the summit, the Everest of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Some have gone so far as to say the Everest of the New Testament, some even the Everest of the Bible. Now that's very high praise indeed, but we've already said that the epistle to the Romans has had a profound impact on the life of many people. Many famous people down through the centuries have been converted to the Christian faith as a consequence of reading Paul's epistle to the Romans. We think about, for example, John and Charles Wesley, the founders of Methodism. Uh, they were converted in large measure through the influence of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Or you think about Martin Luther, the great reformer in the 16th century. He came to an understanding that we are saved by grace through faith and not by works through his study of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Or you go back even further to the great doctor of the church, um, that great scholar from Africa, St. Augustine, who was probably the greatest scholar since the time of the Apostle Paul and theologian who likewise was converted through his reading of Paul's epistle to the Romans. So many people uh, in the past, many people in the present day have been converted as a consequence of this. I think about David Suchet. Anybody know who David Suchet is? Um, he's a well-known British actor, plays Hercule Poirot. Uh, everybody knows who he is. Well, he was converted to Christianity. One night he was staying in a hotel room and he opened the drawer and what did he find but a Gideon Bible. And he tells of how he opened that up and began to read Paul's epistle to the Romans and as a consequence became a believer in Jesus Christ. So many people, as I said, have been transformed through the reading of this book and in particular by the reading of the eighth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans because really this is the summit. Everything has been building up to this point and everything flows out of what Paul has to say here in this eighth chapter of the epistle to the Romans the Romans. Now, you might ask the question, well, that's, that's wonderful, but isn't all of Scripture inspired? Uh, isn't that what Paul says, that all Scripture is theopanustos, that, that is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for instructing, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be complete? Is it ever safe to say that this is the greatest chapter in the Bible? Well, there may be a danger in this. Uh, if for no other reason, then you may find yourself contradicting yourself at a later point. I have sometimes done that. I have said, oh, this is the greatest chapter in the Bible, and somebody will come up to me six months later and say, now, wait a minute, you told me that Ephesians chapter 2 was the greatest chapter in the Bible. Well, Martin Lloyd-Jones once said that for the expositor, for the scholar, for the biblical teacher... The greatest chapter in the Bible should be the one that you are studying at the present time. And since we're studying Paul's epistle to the Romans, this eighth chapter, let's just go ahead and say this is the greatest chapter in the Bible. At the very least, it is one that has had a profound impact, not only on the church, but on the world, the eighth chapter of Romans. Now, let me just go ahead and read through the chapter. It's rather lengthy. But I want to go ahead and read through it. And then what I want to do to begin with is just outline the chapter. There is a lot here. We're going to spend some time in Romans chapter 8. But it might be helpful for you as we work our way through at least to have a general outline. Now, lots of people have outlined this and everybody does it in a slightly different way. So my way may be different from some other commentator that you're reading. But I do think that it's helpful you know, to just take it in pieces how do they say you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And that's the way we're going to have to tackle Romans chapter 8. But let me just go ahead 
and um, read through the chapter. Remember that everything has been building up to this point. Paul begins this epistle by talking about how you and I are under the wrath of God. Uh, We're under condemnation because we know the truth, but we have suppressed the truth, and we have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and we have served and worshiped created things rather than the Creator who is forever blessed, and therefore God has handed us over to do what we want to do. And the result is that we have started on this downward spiral that brings us to the point, you know when you've hit bottom, when you're calling things that are good evil, and you're calling evil things good. And that is a terrible place to be. And the question becomes, well, who will deliver us? Who's going to deliver us from this terrible plight in which we are in? And of course, that's what Paul goes on to unpack. And once he gets to the point where we have been delivered, he then reaches this point where he talks about there being no condemnation. No condemnation. So let's go ahead and read through the chapter. Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You may recall that before we took a break last week for the conference, we were finishing up Romans chapter 7, and we talked about that man at the end of the chapter. Uh, Who was Paul describing? Was Paul describing himself? Or was Paul describing someone else? Was Paul describing someone who was converted and was living in a fleshly or carnal way? Or was Paul describing someone who had not yet been converted? And we said that this idea of the fleshly or carnal Christian is an oxymoron. You cannot be a Christian and live according to the flesh. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. He says, whoever walks according to the flesh walks in a way that is hostile to God. So if your life is characterized by living according to the world, Paul says you are still in battle or at war with God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells within us. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And here comes a section that you're all familiar with, if for no other reason than it's often read at funerals. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. 
And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom He predestined, He called, and those He called, He justified, and those whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think about the contrast. Paul begins this epistle by saying, we are under the wrath of God, all of us without exception. We have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. God has handed us over to do what ought not to be done. We have worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, and the end result of this is our own destruction, and it is exactly what we deserve. But now, but now, now he says, because we are in Christ Jesus, nothing in all of creation, neither height nor depth, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a stark contrast. That's what Romans 8 is really all about. This, in many ways, is the main focus of the epistle. I said this is why it's a summit. We have been climbing toward this point, and this is really what Paul's epistle is all about. This is where everything has been moving, and everything that Paul is going to say from here on out to the end of the epistle flows from this. So it really is the pinnacle, if you will, the watershed. Everything flows down one side or the other from Romans chapter 8. Well, let me just give you a general outline of this chapter so that we can tackle it and understand the implications of this teaching for our life. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, is what you might call the thesis statement. It is the main theme of the chapter. There is no condemnation. That's what this chapter is about. That for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. That's the main point that Paul is making. Now, why is there no condemnation? As we said, everything flows out of that thesis statement. Paul is now going to unpack the implications. He says, first of all, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Verses 2 through 4, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. That's why we said that latter part of Romans chapter 7 is really Paul speaking autobiographically, isn't it? And it's something that we can all relate to. The very things I want to do, I do not do. And the very things I hate, what? Those are the things I find myself doing. 
Even if you want to do good, you find that you're powerless to do it. And even though you want to resist temptation, you find yourself powerless to resist it. Can we all relate to that? Of course we can. And if it's up to us, therefore, to earn a right relationship with God, what hope is there for us? That's why Paul, in despair, cries out, Who will deliver me? And then he immediately answers his own question, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he can go on at the beginning of the very next chapter to say there is therefore now no condemnation. Therefore, there is no condemnation. Why? Because God has delivered us in the person of Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation because the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, has set us free from the Spirit of the law. Our flesh weakened, could not keep the law, so Jesus Christ came and kept it on our behalf, even taking the penalty for the breaking of the law, which is death. So the first reason there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus is because we have been set free from the law. That is to say, we have been set free from sin's penalty. For the wages of sin is death. So what has happened here is that we have been set free from the law's penalty. But it's not just that we have been set free from the law's penalty. We have also, Paul says, been set free from the law's power. Up to this point, the very things we wanted to do, we could not do. And the very things we hated, those are the things we were doing. We were in bondage. But now, he says, there is one who dwells within us who gives us the power to resist those things and to fulfill those things that we desire to do it. It's not us. It is now Christ working within us. That's why Paul elsewhere can say, I can do all things. Now, it's interesting. Paul doesn't say, I can do all things because I'm just a wonderful person. He says what? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So it's true. When you're not in Christ Jesus, you're powerless. The law has complete control over your life, and it condemns you because you cannot keep it. But now that Christ comes to abide within you by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are no longer left to your own strength. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's another reason why Paul says we know that we are not condemned, because we are not left without a helper, an advocate, one to assist us. Don't you remember that's what Jesus said to his disciples? He said, the time is coming. Imagine if you're Peter... James, John, Andrew, and you're sitting there, and you've just been with Jesus for three years, and he tells you he's going away. He says, but take heart, you're going to do greater things than even I have done. Now, they're probably thinking to themselves, how in the world is that even possible? Having seen all the miracles that Jesus performed, the cleansing of lepers, the opening of the eyes of the blind, the lame leaping for joy, the dead being raised, the, the calming of the sea the multiplication of the five loaves and the two fish, and we're going to do greater things than that, that's not power, that's not even possible. But Jesus is saying, it's not that you are going to do it, it's that I'm going to do it in and through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love that first chapter of Acts chapter 1, when Jesus says to him, the time is coming when you will receive power. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the ends of the earth. You know that the word that is translated power in that passage is the Greek word dynamis, from which we get the word dynamite. An explosive power will come upon you. And that's how we know that we are not condemned. Because if we are in Christ Jesus, God the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So we have been set free from sin's penalty. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we have also been set free from sin's power. We have also become God's children. Look at verses 15 through 17. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Keep your finger there in Romans, and I want you to turn back to John chapter 1, very beginning of John's Gospel. Now, I have made this point many times before, but I'm always astonished that no matter how many times I make it, people somehow still miss it. And I think they miss it because the message that the church preaches and the message that the world preaches are very different. The message that you often hear in the world today is very popular in this politically correct culture, this woke culture even, to say that we are all children of God. How many of you have ever heard that? Well, aren't we all just children of God? I mean, it's, it's the idea of the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. We're all God's children. Well, I want you to understand that that is a very nice notion, but it simply is not a biblical notion. The Bible nowhere, nowhere teaches that you and I, by nature, simply by our inclusion within the human race, are children of God. Now, we are all creatures of God, that is true. And not only creatures, we are, in a sense, exalted creatures because we've been made in the image of God. We are, we are given imagination, creativity, the power to think, to process, even the awareness of time passing us by. No other creature on earth has those things. A moral sense. A sense of what is right and wrong, what is true and what is false, what is beautiful, what is noble, what is lovely. That is something that is part of what it means to be human and is the result of being made in the image of God. But that does not make us a child of God. Look at John chapter 1 for just a moment. We're going to read through verses 1 through 12. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You know this passage because we read it every year at Christmas. It's about the incarnation, the highest Christology you'll find anywhere in Scripture. Skip down to verse 9. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And this is very important. It would have been very important for Jews living in the first century. Children who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. You see, you become a child of God. You're not automatically a child of God. And how do you become a child of God? By adoption. And how is it that you are adopted? By believing on His name. By receiving and believing. That's how you become a child of God. But if you are a child of God, if you have been adopted into the family of God, then Paul says, going back now to Romans chapter 8, you have no fear of condemnation because you are now God's children. I think I pointed this out to you in the past, that in the ancient world, it was possible to disinherit your natural children. You found that your child had gone off the rails and had done terrible things, and you just said, well, I'm, that's it. I'm cutting him out of the will. That's one of the reasons why Jesus' parable of the prodigal son is so powerful. When that young man came to his father and said, I want my inheritance and I want it right now, it was the equivalent of saying to his dad, I wish you were dead. Now understand 
that that was the first century. That was not the 21st century where parents tend to be more indulgent and, you know, realize, well, he's had a tough life and school hasn't been everything that he hoped for. And so, you know, you're, you're, no, no, no. In that day, it was a shame-based society. And this young man came up and basically told his father he wished he were dead. And that father had every right to throw him out and disinherit him. Indeed, you'll remember the other brother, the elder brother, expected that that's what would happen. He got angry when the boy came home and the father received him, put a ring on his finger, a mantle about his shoulders, and killed the fatted calf. He said, look, this son of yours, I love the way he puts that. He didn't even say, my brother. I'm not calling him my brother. That son of yours. See, that's what we would expect. But what's interesting is that while you could disinherit your natural children in the ancient world, when you made a decision to adopt a child according to the law, you could not disinherit them. And so we become children of God, not naturally, not by virtue of our birth or the will of the flesh, as John says, but we become children of God by adoption, by receiving and believing. And when we are adopted into the family of God, there is nothing Nothing that can separate us now from God. That's why Paul says there's no condemnation anymore. There's no more judgment. And we know this why? Because we've been set free from the law of sin. Sin's penalty. We've been set free from the power of sin. Christ now dwells within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have been adopted into the family of God. We have been made sons and daughters. And that means we can never be disinherited again. Period. And it's not just that. It's not just what we experience in the present. There is also the hope of glory. We have become children of God. Isn't that what Paul says? Children of God and what? Heirs. We can call God Abba. That's a very interesting term. It's the term that Jesus used as he cried out from the cross. Abba. What does it mean? It's a very intimate term. It means much more than father. It means daddy. So we've been adopted into the family of God. We have an intimate relationship with our father to the degree that we can call him daddy. And we are not only his children, but because we are his children, we are also his what? His heirs. When you're the heir of a wealthy man, what that means is that everything he has is yours. When you become a child of God, all that is God's, all the riches that belong to him as the Lord of the cosmos belongs to you and will one day come to you. He will hold nothing back. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And we know that Christ gets everything that the Father has. That's one of the remarkable things about Jesus Christ is that he is one with the Father. The glory, the majesty is all his. And we're told in Philippians that he left the glory, the majesty, let them go and came down. That great hymn of Kenosis. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself what? Nothing. Took the form of his servant and became obedient unto death, even death upon the cross. He had the best, he let it go. But then what? As a result of his obedience, God hath highly exalted him and given him that name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He left the glory came down, took on poverty, died the death of the cross, and because of his obedience was highly exalted and received that much back again. And Paul says, we are heirs with Christ. 
We have died to the sin and to the flesh that once controlled our lives. And now having died to that, we have been raised to the new life of grace. We have been adopted into the family of God. And now whatever Christ has received, we shall receive as fellow heirs with him. At the very least, that means that place where there is no more sorrow, no more grief, no more sighing, no more separation, but life everlasting, that place where God himself is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. There is no condemnation because we've been delivered from sin's penalty, sin's power. We've been adopted into the family of God. We have an inheritance. And not only that, but right now we have the down payment on that inheritance. How do you know that you're going to get the inheritance? Well, think about purchasing a piece of property. One of the things that you have to put down when you buy a piece of property oftentimes, especially recently when we were going through that craze of people, you know, having bidding wars about houses and so forth, you put down what is known as earnest money, don't you? A down payment. Now, that's not the full payment, but it is a payment in trust. It basically says, I'm giving you this in good faith with the assurance that you're going to get the rest. Well, do you realize that God has given us a down payment? How do you know you're going to inherit all the riches of heaven, the glory, the majesty that is with Christ? Because God's given you a down payment. And that down payment, he says, is God the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. And it is his presence in your life, producing the character of Christ. The fruits of the Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If you see yourself producing that kind of fruit, then you know the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And if the Holy Spirit dwells within you, that's the down payment on the final inheritance. That's how you know there is no condemnation for you. How many of you have ever worried about whether or not you're really saved? Even, even in, in, in a fleeting moment of doubt, wondered, oh, Lord, how could you save me? Anybody ever had that? I do. But God doesn't want us to be gripped by fear and doubt, and so he gives us all of these things as the assurance. And the assurance that we will one day be saved, we shall and receive that inheritance, is the fact that he has given us a down payment in the person of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. So we have the intercession of the Holy Spirit. And not only that, but we have a hope for the present. It's not just our future inheritance we also can live confidently in the present. It doesn't mean that life is easy. We still live in a fallen world, but even though we live in a fallen world, a world that is characterized by evil, wickedness, vice, all of those things, nevertheless, we can be joyful Christians. Now, I didn't say happy Christians. God is going to give us everything that we need. He does not promise to give us everything that we want. Understand that. God will give you everything that you need. He notes even the fall of the sparrow from the sky. But he doesn't promise to give you everything that you want. And there are any number of reasons. That's a whole other lesson. There are any number of reasons why he may not do that. But take it for granted that he knows what's best. But he will give you everything that you need. And he does have a plan for your life. And that's what verses 28 through 39 are all about. And again, these are the most famous and indeed the most popular words from this chapter. And we know that for those who love God, that is to say, those 
who have been set free from sin's penalty, from sin's power, those who have been adopted into the family of God as sons and daughters, those who have the hope of the inheritance and the down payment of the Holy Spirit, he says that we know that for them, all things work together for good. All things. Even the disasters, the catastrophes, the sorrows, the heartbreaks in your life God is ultimately using them for good. Now, what is the good? Well, at the very least, the good is to transform you into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the greatest good. God wants to make you beautiful. You know, we value beauty, physical beauty, in our world. If you're a beautiful person, you can pretty much write your ticket in this world. Well, God wants to make you beautiful, but it's a lasting beauty, not a fleeting beauty. Physical beauty, folks, as much as we highly prize it, is a very fleeting thing. You know how I know? Because of the law of gravity. <laughs> Whatever goes up must come down. But we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that we might be the firstborn. See, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that's the key. In order that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. This is God's plan for the life of those who have been adopted into his family by grace, by believing and receiving. His plan is to do what? To make them beautiful creatures. Beautiful in the sense that when he looks at them, what he sees is not their own reflection, but the reflection of his own son. I probably used this illustration before, but years ago, um, I was in Istanbul. And if you go to Istanbul today, uh, they have that grand market. It's a magnificent place. And they sell everything there you can imagine. Spices, rugs, and jewelry. Lots and lots of jewelry. And uh, when I went there, which was probably 15 years ago, was the last time I've been there twice, but I think about maybe... 15 years ago was the last time I was there in Istanbul. I remember those who were smelting silver and making silver jewelry. And what they would do is they would take coins that are given to them by foreign tourists and they melt them down. And they have this little pot and they throw in the coins and they apply heat. Now you know that most coins contain silver and a host of other things. And what they'll do is they'll apply heat And the more heat that they apply, the more impurities float to the surface. And then they have a device, a stick really, and they take it and they skim off those impurities and apply more heat. And the more heat they apply, the more impurities flow to the surface. And they keep doing this until the silver is pure. Now, how do they know the silver is pure? When they can look into the pot and see their own reflection staring back at them. Understand this, God will apply heat to your life sometimes. He will allow you to go through difficulties, trials, struggles, but all he is doing is applying heat like a refiner's fire. So that one day when he looks into your life, what he sees staring back is something that is pure and beautiful, namely his own reflection. And that is what we see happening here in Romans chapter 8. That is what God is doing. And we know that this is what God is doing because of five golden words. They've been described as the five golden links of salvation. We find them there in verse 29. For those whom God foreknew... That's the first word, foreknew. He also predestined. That's the second word. And those he predestined, he called. 
And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he will also glorify. What I think is so important about that is that this is how God works out our salvation. And I say God works out our salvation because you'll notice that it's God who does all the work here. What do we contribute to this process? Nothing. Listen to it again, and we'll unpack it when we actually go through this section of the chapter. But just at the beginning here, it's so important to remember that there's no condemnation for us. Why? Because those whom God foreknew, that is to say, those God took note of, he also predestined. And those he predestined... And what did he predestine them for? To be conformed to the image of his son. And those he predestined, he what? He called them. And those he called, he justified. That is to say, brought into a right relationship, lined them up with himself. And those he justified, he will also glorify. It's the work of God from stem to stern. It is God who takes note of us. Even before the foundations of the earth, before you were born, as David said, God knit you together in your mother's womb. Even before you were a twinkle in mama's eye, God knew you. He knew you and he predestined you. That is to say he had a plan for your life. And that plan was to conform you to the image of his son. And having predestined you, he then called you. Now, when did that calling take place? For some of you, it took place perhaps when you were a child. For some of you, it took place in the middle-aged years. For some of you, it's taking place right now. But the point is that God calls you. And when he calls you and you receive and believe, he justifies and he will glorify. Now, I want to qualify something I just said. I said, when he calls you and you receive and believe. Let me put it to you this way. When God calls you, you will receive and believe. It's called an effectual call. It's the grace of God. This is why C.S. Lewis and others have described God as the hound of heaven. I think that was a term that was originally coined by G.K. Chesterton. But think about it. It's a wonderful expression, the hound of heaven. We spend our whole lives running away from God to do our own thing. But when God gets your scent, folks, he's going to track you down. He's going to run you down. He's going to bring you to the end of yourself. Because he has a plan for your life. To bring you in fellowship with him and to glorify you. Five golden links in this chain of salvation God does them all. And it's because God does it, and it's not our work. See, if it was up to us, if we saved ourselves, if we contributed anything besides the sin from which we needed to be redeemed, if we added even the smallest iota to the process of salvation, then there's always the smallest chance that we might blow it. But because it is the work of God from start to finish, from stem to stern, Therefore, and that's what Paul says, therefore, we know that nothing can separate us. So from those five golden links, Paul asks in verses 31 through 39, five unanswerable questions. If God foreknew us, if God predestined us, if God called us, if God justified us, and if God glorified us, well then, who can be against us? If God is for us in this way, who can be against us? If God foreknew us, predestined us, called us, justified, glorified us, how will he not also give us all things? I mean, think about that for a minute. 
If a wealthy man gives you $100,000 and you're parking a car with that man, he said, I'm going to give you $100,000 just because I love you. And then you pull into a parking space and discover you don't have a dime for the parking meter. Do you think he's going to withhold the dime? He's already given you so much. Do you think he's going to withhold that little bit? Paul is saying God has already given you the best that he has. He's given you his very own son. If he's already given you the best that he has, is he going to withhold salvation from you? If it is God who foreknew, who predestined us, who called us, who justified us, who glorified us, who can bring any charge against us? Who can accuse us? And if it is God who foreknew us, predestined us, conformed us, called us, justified us, glorified us, who can condemn us? And most importantly, who can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? And the obvious answer to all of those questions is no one. No one. Perhaps you can begin to see why Romans chapter 8 really is the pinnacle, the summit of this epistle, and not just really of this epistle, but of the whole Bible. This is the gospel in a nutshell, folks. Romans chapter 8 is the sure cure for despair and disappointment no matter what you're facing. Because it tells us who God is. It tells us what God has done on our behalf. And it reminds us that because it has been the work of God from start to finish, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Neither height nor depth, neither angels nor principalities, neither things present nor things to come, not even you yourself can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this great epistle to the Romans, and we thank you. It's been a long slog, a long climb, and the picture has been bleak to say the least, but all of a sudden you get to Romans 8 and the clouds part and the sun shines down and we find the hope of glory. Grant that if there be any here today who have not been adopted into your family, that they might receive and believe today. Perhaps through the speaking of my voice, they hear the voice of the Good Shepherd calling them even now into a personal relationship. Grant them the grace to acknowledge their sin, to receive Jesus Christ, to be adopted into his family, and to become heirs of his everlasting kingdom. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.